Thank you, Lois. And good to see you tonight. Some of you's wondering why I'm up here so quick. We're doing things out of order tonight. I, I came in Friday morning, or when Eddie got here Friday, or whichever one got here first. Uh, I, I've, I've done this before with different messages that I would preach, and, and that is I would, I would preach a little bit, and then we would sing a song that kind of fit. It was according to what we were talking about, and I decided that this message tonight lended itself to, uh, to doing that. If you've been with us for the past one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sunday nights, this is Sunday night number eight. We've had a couple of days, Easter and Mother's Day, where we didn't meet on Sunday evening, but all the others we've been talking about, the, the Lord's Prayer and what the Lord's Prayer was about. Now, depending on your translation of the Bible, you may or may not have this verse in your Bible. If you read the NIV version of the Bible, what we're going to talk about tonight is not in your Bible. I don't know why it's not in your Bible, but it's, it's not in there. Or it wasn't in the copy that, that I had that I was reading. And uh, a, a lot of people will say, as they read some commentaries and different commentators of the Bible regarding this verse that they will say that this portion, these words, were not a part of what we consider the original manuscript and they were words that were added later and they really weren't words that were spoken by Jesus. But here's my opinion for whatever it's worth. My opinion and a dollar might buy you a cup of coffee somewhere. I don't know if it would or not. But here's what I'm of the opinion of, that this is God's Word. And God is mighty enough that He has preserved His Word. And God is mighty enough that He has guarded the transmission of His Word. And it's my opinion that He wanted us to have this portion of Scripture that we will read of tonight. In fact, as, as we have the, the Bible, as we read it, I use the New King James, as you're aware, that we have what the Lord wants us to have. And, uh, and, and that's the Word of God as we, as we have it. So tonight, I hope this portion is in your Bible, and we're going to find that the portion that we read tonight is about rejoicing. Over the past seven, eight weeks, we've found that the Lord's Prayer, as He came and He told them, He said, when you pray, pray like this, and He gives them the model. We found that the first few words, our Father which art in heaven, we found that those are words that give us rest because of who He is and where He is and what He's doing. Then we found the next part was about reverencing, and we read those words, hallowed, be thy name. Then we found the next section was about his reigning, thy kingdom come. Then the next week we found that it was about us resigning when the prayer says, thy will be done. Then we found that it was about requesting when he told us of our daily needs to, to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Then we found that it was about releasing and that part of the prayer says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then the last time we were here on Sunday evening, we found out that it was about relying, us relying on him. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now tonight we find that it's about rejoicing, and we all like to rejoice. Well, what do we rejoice about? We rejoice about this fact. As we come to the close of this prayer, we're given these words, For thine, who is thine? For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. In a world that is so filled with problems, trials, tribulations, morally, spiritually, financially, and all those other kind of problems, it's a comfort. It should be a comfort to us 
to have a God who is worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor that we can muster up to offer to him tonight. It's a comfort also to find someone, the someone, who is worthy, who can take care of all of our needs, all of our desires, all of those things that happen in life. And when we find that someone, and he is that someone, that's reason for us to rejoice. Tonight we're going to find that we can rejoice about three things. And they're going to go in this order. We can rejoice about his, or in his preeminence. And we can rejoice in his power. And we can rejoice in his personality. So to set the stage for that portion of the message about his preeminence, Eddie's going to come and, and lead us in a hymn, the old hymn, This Is My Father's World. We'll have the words up on the screen, but if you want to turn in your hymnal, it's hymn 58. <laughs> this is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me. The music of the spheres This is my Father's world I rest me in the thought Of rocks and trees, of skies and seas His hand the wonders wrought This is my Father's world He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one Amen. Thank you brother Eddie. We can rejoice in his preeminence tonight. Well what does that mean? What does it mean when we say that he's preeminent? Well two things come to my mind and I want to share those with you tonight and, and first of all it would be that he's sovereign he is sovereign. Well, you say, well, what does that mean? We, we've heard it all of our life. We've heard preachers say, and we've heard it in Sunday school, and we've probably even heard it in vacation Bible school, that, that he's a sovereign God. Well, what does that mean? Well, the word means this, independent and holding complete power. Independent and holding complete power. Now, our English word comes from a Latin word, or the, a, a word in the Latin language, and that word means over and above. Over and above. So that really describes who God is, doesn't it? He's over and above. He's over and above. He's over and above this world. 
He's over and above all of us. That's why the Bible can tell us in, 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 in total truth when, when the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, the eighth verse, he says, he says and the Lord is it's the word of the Lord here, but he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. Now, what does that mean? That it, it has to mean one of two things. If his words are not our, if, if his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts, then his ways either have to be above ours or below ours. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist tonight to figure out that his thoughts and his ways and his words are not below ours. Isn't that right? So then we have to know that, that they're above ours. And, and, and listen, as we look around the world tonight, and as we look around the, the, the nation and the, and the entire world that we live in, it looks like, it looks like to us, to the naked eye, that, that, that Satan and the forces of evil are winning. Whoever thought that we as a nation would come to a debate about which, which restroom to go in? Who, whoever thought of, uh, as of about a year or a year and a half ago that we would have been debating is marriage between a man and a woman or, 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 or whatever else? It, it kind of looks like and it kind of seems like tonight to the naked human eye that, that Satan and the forces of evil are winning. In, in, in fact, there, there is a, there, there's a visible physical kingdom that we see and it's that kingdom that looks like things are just going haywire and things are out of control and things are just spinning almost into a, into oblivion as we watch these things but you have to remember that our culture even our nation tonight is dominated by fallen men and a creature called the devil you say, preacher, do you, do you mean that the devil is, he, he, that, he's, that he's kind of out, out front there? Well, here's what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, where the Bible says, whose mind's the God, and that's a little g, the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the glory of the, glo the, the, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. Now, now, we can see that. And that's why things seem to be out of control and out of kilter and all messed up. But, but what we cannot see is another battle going on. And the battle that we cannot see is a battle that's invisible to the eye. We read about it in Scripture. The Word of God tells us about it, that there's a battle going on. But there's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a kingdom like Great Britain or, or the kingdoms of the past, but, but there's, a, there's a spiritual kingdom. And this spiritual kingdom is dominated and it's ruled and it's led by an all-powerful, sovereign God. A God who is working out a perfect eternal plan in this world. I believe this, and I think we could document it from Scripture, that God is even in charge of those who do not willfully follow him. And he is, that, that's the way that it's always been. Listen, the Bible is clear. The Bible is absolutely clear that we serve an all-powerful God who is in absolute control of everything. Let me read you a few verses of Scripture. Isaiah 43, 13. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Isaiah 46, 10, and 11, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Indeed, or yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. And the Lord continues and he says, I have purposed it. And he finishes that verse with, I will also do it. 
I tell you tonight, he's in control. Our God is sovereign. Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Things may look out of control. Things may look harem scarum. Things may look out of, out of kilter tonight. But I tell you, it's, it's not those people in Washington, D.C. that are in charge. It's not the people that are on the, on the primary seats of the United Nations or any other group that are in charge. I tell you tonight, we have a sovereign God who is in charge. And tonight, if you're a child of God, you can rejoice because he's sovereign. He's sovereign. So we can rejoice. Now, let, let me give you a quick history rundown. When, when these words come, when, when the Scripture says that he's, that he's teaching them to pray and, and he says, for yours is the kingdom. Now, who's, who's in charge politically at this time? And it, it's, not, it's not him. Who's in charge politically? It would be the Caesars, okay? And, and, and the Caesar who is in charge... He not only ruled Rome, but I'm telling you, he, had, he ruled Rome in all of his power. But the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire stretched from the British Isles all the way across the Mediterranean as far away as India. Now, now Caesar, the Caesar of the time, he, he had power over every man, woman, boy, and girl pretty much on the face of the, at least in the known world. He had, he had power over him. But then Jesus comes along. Now, this is a revolutionary statement. It's not revolutionary to us because we've heard this all of our life. But that's the world setting at this time, and, 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 and Caesar is in control, and, 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 and the, the empire is, is the vast majority of the world. And then, and then Jesus comes along here, and he says, When you pray, thine, not Caesar's, is the kingdom. Thine is the kingdom. You see, there was a time... When, 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 when Caesar was ruling the world, had all the pomp and circumstance, had all the regal and royalty and the robes and the power and, and all of these things, the, 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 the Caesar was a man who with the point of a finger could change your life. He, he was a man who wielded enough power that if he did this and pointed at Jerry, he, he had a group of people that they'd just come take Jerry out. I'm telling you, he wielded enough power that, that at the snap of a finger, it could literally change or even end a person's life. The signing of his name on a document could change everything, everything. And at the time that he was reigning, in, in a little town called Bethlehem, in a stable, a little boy was born. And those two kingdoms, the kingdom of, of Caesar and, and the kingdom of Christ, they paralleled the, 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 the palace and the stable. Well, you know how this story plays out and save time. We won't run all the rabbits down. But, but we know that one day these two kingdoms come into conflict. We know that they don't run parallel forever. They, they have to they, they cross. And, 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 and when that happens at, at the conclusion of that or when, when that comes to a place, I tell you, it's not the great kingdom of the Roman Empire that emerges victorious. The stable does. The little old stable in, in almost a little God-forsaken town that has said nothing good ever comes out of Bethlehem. He comes out victorious. He comes out victorious. When, when we pray, when we pray this, 
prayer, and, and when we pray these words as the early Christians did, we don't pray bowing to anybody other than the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Don't let a cynical world tell you that God is out of business because I tell you tonight, he's still in business. He still saves lost people. He still restores homes. He still restores lives. He still brings hope. He's still on the throne, and, on, and the kingdom of this world is his. He is sovereign. But he's not just sovereign. He's supreme. And that's not in a pizza. He's supreme. Our Lord rules because it's his right to do so. Now, now you think about that. Our Lord rules. He's sovereign. And he rules because it's his right to do that very thing. You see, when, when man was created and placed in the Garden of Eden... Here's what happened. He was given dominion. Here's what it says in Genesis 1 in the 26th verse. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And here's, here's the part I want you to hear. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Remember that? Well, then, then, then you, you, you read on down in verse 27, says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and then God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Well, not too long after this, Man messes up. And what happens is, 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 is that we, we kind of give away our dominion. We, we kind of we give that up. Now, 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 Satan is the one, and we read that 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Now, it, it, it's Satan that we can say that he is the little g God of the world. He, he, he is that person. Now, when Jesus comes into the world, and, and when Jesus lives his life and then he comes to the conclusion of his life and he, he dies on the cross and he, he, he is resurrected from the dead, he redeemed everything that man, that Adam, had given away. He paid the price. He paid the price. He stripped that evil pretender Satan. He stripped him of all of his dreams. Satan had has always dreamed of ruling the world. You know that? He, that's always been his desire. It's always been his dream. It's always been his want to. Well, when Jesus paid the price for your sins and mine, he stripped Satan, the, the pretender Satan, of his dreams of doing that. So I tell you tonight, I know that we deal with the, with, with the consequences and all of those things, and, and Satan seems to be in control, but I'm telling you tonight that the supreme ruler of our universe is not Satan. It is a holy, sovereign, and supreme God. And when we begin to think, even though our world's in a mess, even though we don't have much to, to elect come election time, He's still in charge, and he's still preeminent, and, and, and he's still working out a plan that's according to his will. He did not wake up this morning and say, well, my goodness, i never seen this coming. I don't know how many times in the last few weeks I've heard the words, well, how in the world did Donald Trump ever get to be the Republican nominee or presumptive nominee, I guess we would say. I'm telling you, God on his throne in heaven did not say, i never seen this Donald Trump guy coming. He's preeminent. He is sovereign. He is supreme. 
And, 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 and so when we pray this portion of this prayer, we're acknowledging his supremacy and our subjection to his supremacy. We're acknowledging that he is the king and we're just lowly servants in this kingdom. This implies that we, if you're saved, we are his. And we are his alone. And, and, and nobody else is in charge except him. And that, my friends, is reason that his preeminence, his sovereignty, and his supremacy. To know regardless of, of what's going on in this world and all of the things that are going on, we can go to bed tonight and we can awake in the morning knowing that our God is in charge. He's supreme and he's sovereign. Eddie, come lead us a song. It's about his power, I think. Stand up. What are we saying? I oh, forgot. worship the king. Oh, worship the king. Oh, worship the king, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his wonderful love, our shield and defender. Chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercy. How tender <clears throat> to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. Be seated. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Well, what in the world does that entail, Brother Steve? Well, Two things about his power. One, his power is enormous. His power is enormous. And we're told to rejoice. To rejoice in the fact that he, not only is he in charge, and not only is he sovereign, and not only those things that we mentioned a while ago, not only rejoice in those things, but he has the power to control all of those things. I tell you tonight, we don't serve a weak God. We don't serve a God that's like old King Zedekiah that we mentioned this morning. He didn't have a spine. He tried to run and hide out the back door. We don't serve a king like that. We serve a king of great power. We serve a king of great ability. And the Bible teaches us that he can do anything that he pleases. He's almighty. Listen to what the Scripture says. A few verses that talk about the power of God. Genesis 18, 14, I'm not going to read the whole verse, but it says, is anything too hard for the Lord? We know the answer to that. In Genesis 18, the answer to that was no. And today, the answer to that is no. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Job 42, 2, I know that thou canst do everything that, that no thought can be withholden from thee. Psalm 62, 11, God has spoken once. Twice I heard this, that power belongeth to God. Now, let, 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 let me share something about that, about that verse in, in Psalm 62, 11, where, where the Bible says God has spoken once, and then there's a, 
a colon or a semicolon, depending on your, on your translation. And then, and then the next little phrase begins with twice. What that means is this. It's not something that just happened one time or two times. But what that meant out of, out of the Hebrew language is that was the Hebrew's way of saying something had been given or said or spoken many times repeatedly. So, so when it says that, that, that God has spoken, it's saying God has spoken many, 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 many times that power belongeth to God. In Jeremiah 32, 17, the Bible says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Matthew 19, 26 says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. All things are possible. Mark 10, 27, and Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Ephesians 3, 20 says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I tell you tonight, his, his power is enormous. You begin to think about the things. We, we can't make the list of things that he can't do or, or that, that, that are not impossible for him. But just think about, just think about this little old short list of things. God cannot lie. God cannot change. God cannot make a mistake. God cannot fail. And, and when, we when we come before him in prayer, the Scripture teaches us that we can pray in and with confidence because he has the power not only to hear, but he has the power to do what it is that we're asking him to do and to grant our request. And I realize tonight that we're a bunch of old Baptists, but it ought to make us say hallelujah or something. He has that power. He does. Well, not only, not only is his power enormous, his power is eternal. His power is eternal. We're told in this little part of this verse his, that his kingdom, his power, and his glory are forever. Forever. Uh, another of the great attri attributes of God's kind of mentioned it just a second ago. It's his immutability. And, and the word immutable simply, simply means that something is unchanging or unable to change. L listen, to, listen to what the Bible and how, he, how the Bible describes our, our, our Lord. Malachi 3, 6 said, I am the Lord, I do not change. Hebrews 13, 8, and we, 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 we quote this one quite often. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. James 1, 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. How many of you know there's some more to that verse? Here's what it says. With whom there is no variance. And that variance speaks of change. There is no variation. There is no shadow of turning. So you say, what does that mean, preacher? That means this, that his power today is the same as it has always been. If he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, if he cannot change and does not change, that means, you know, we, we, we kind of, well, I got up this morning about, about 6 o'clock. And I had a little bit more energy this morning about 6 o'clock than I do right now. And it's because I have been using out of my energies. And I, I don't have what I had at 6 o'clock this morning. God's not that way. You see, 
God is the same God today that he was then. And, and the fact that he has parted the Red Sea and the fact that he has fed his people with, 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 with manna and the fact that he has delivered them and brought them out of captivity and he, has, and he has done all of these things. And then we get to the New Testament, we find all these things that God has done. He is still tonight the same God that he was then, bless his name. His power is eternal. And if this old world were to stand another thousand years and, and they were still to have church at a place called Trinity Baptist in Lufkin, Texas, whoever stands behind a, a podium such as this, they could stand a thousand years from now and make the same proclamation that the power of our sovereign preeminent God is eternal. He has all power. All God has ever been. He still is. And he will continue to be. Because you remember what he said in the Old Testament? He was talking to Moses, I believe, without looking back and tracking it down. He said, Moses, when he said, who do I need to tell them sent me? Remember what he told him? He said, you tell them that the great I am sent you. I tell you tonight. He is still the great I am. He's still the I am, and he has the ability and he has the power to grant your request and whatever the things are that you'll need in your life. Now, we're fixing to talk about his personality. So Eddie's going to come and lead us in the, the old hymn of the church. I don't know what it is. Glory to his name, was that it? I, 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 I knew I did know it one time, but I forgot. So I'm working out of a barred memory. So you sing this hymn with us. Then we'll finish. <laughs> rejoice in his preeminence we can rejoice in his power and we can rejoice in his personality scripture says for thine is the kingdom that's his preeminence and the power and the glory the glory let me give you two thoughts about his glory one is he alone deserves glory he alone deserves glory. Try this thought. 
everything God is doing exercises his preeminence, exercises his sovereignty, exercises his supremacy, and the fact that he's over all things. His power is for his glory. If we were to ask the question, all, all of us would be in agreement. In fact, somebody I talked to this morning, we was talking about something, and, and, and we come to the conclusion, and we all know this, that we're all doing better than we deserve. We're blessed abundantly far and above what we deserve to be blessed. Well, why does God do that? The, the same thought could be laid on the, on the subject of, of our salvation. He didn't save us because we deserved it. He didn't save us because we were worthy of it. Well, if we were asked, well, why does God, as Christian people now, why does God do the things that he does? Why does he exercise his power? Why does he do things in our lives? Why does he bless us the way that he blesses us? It's so that we will honor him and that we will glorify him. I, I tell you tonight that I believe that he does what he does, that he might be honored by his creation. And you do know that you're a part of his creation. I'm a part of his creation. So he does what he does in our lives so that he can be honored by, by his creation. He does what he does so that we could be drawn to a place in our life where we would worship him for all that he does. Listen, he doesn't work in our lives so we can come to church as many of us do and, and sit there like a proverbial bump on a log. He doesn't. He does the things. He blesses us and he, he supplies for us and he keeps us up and going and, and all of the things that we're so undeserving of. He does all of those things so that we will glorify him. But we live in the me and the my world. I, I'm healthy because I take care of myself. I'm going to tell you one thing I've noticed. I know, I know I'm overweight. And I know I'm fat. I'm not as fat as I have been before. But I'm fat. But you know what I've noticed? I've noticed skinny people drop dead of heart attacks. So if we're going to drop dead of a heart attack, I'm going to go with a Dr. Pepper and a Little Debbie. <laughs> we are what we are because of his blessings on our life. And his blessings on our life ought to cause us to honor and glorify him for all of the things that he is doing, has done, is doing, and will be doing in the days to come in our life. Listen to what the Bible says in the 8th Psalm. The first verse, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. There's a story told of King Louis, I think it's the 14th, I, can, I, I think that's the right one. He was oftentimes referred to as the proud sun king. Well, he, he, he lived in great opulence and great splendor and great royalty and, and, and all of those things. And I think it's about 17... 10, 17, 15 or so, he, he reigned until that time, and, and, and then, he, then he died. Well, he, he, had, he, had accomplished some, he had accomplished a lot of things for the uh, French Empire that were, that, that were good culturally and socially and all these things, but, but, but quite honestly, man, he wasn't, he wasn't much of a king. He, he lived a very immoral life in many areas. Well, the, the day came when he was going to, that he, he had died, they came, they'd gone through the mourning process, and they come to the time of the burial and the funeral and the burial and all of those things. And, and the cathedral where they were having this thing was jam-packed. I mean, it was a, it was, they, they were putting on the dog, so to speak, at this guy's funeral. And the priest got up there. Man, I mean, they had had all of these things going on, and, and this little old priest, 
he got up in the midst of that, of that funeral service and he made a statement that caused a cold chill to go run through the congregation. And he said this, after all of the things had been said about King Louis the Fourteenth, this guy said, only God is great. Only God is great. As we pass through life, as we, as we go through, and, and, and sometimes we, we get guilty of this, sometimes we try to gain glory for ourselves. We do things so other people will notice and, 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 and all of those things. But I'm going to tell you tonight, the Bible teaches us that God alone deserves all the glory. The Bible teaches us that he is a jealous God. And he is not going to share his glory with anyone. I tell you tonight, he deserves, he deserves our glory. Now let me give you this thought just for a finale. He alone determines glory. He alone determines glory. His kingdom and his power and his glory are forever. This, 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 is, a, this is a promise we can rejoice in. But let me tell you, when, when we come to the end of, of our road, when we come to the proverbial end of this world, I, I want you to know that it is he who determines those who will share glory with him for eternity. You see, it's only those who are in a grace relationship. It's only those who have been saved by the grace of God that will, that will share glory with him someday. Glory as in heaven. Listen, the Bible says, Jesus speaking in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me or through me. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven. No other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So I ask you this question tonight. Are you saved? Because if you're not saved, you can serve on the church council. You can be the pastor of the church. You can be the pianist. You can be the music minister. You can be a Sunday school teacher. And if you're not saved, you will not spend eternity in glory. You, you, you just absolutely will not. It, it, it won't happen. But if you are saved, if you're in a grace relationship with, with, with our Lord Jesus Christ, then one day, Oh, we get glimpses of his glory down here, don't we? Now we sit in a good service, we hear a good song, it speaks to our heart, and we say, man, that, that was just glorious. Well, you know, that, that glory down here, it, it doesn't last very long. But then we go out in the real world and, and we got all that stuff. But one day, one day, bless God, we're going to spend eternity in him, not for a few days, but forever forever and we can rejoice in that he ends that prayer with this word he says for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and then there's one more word amen what does that mean you know sometimes we just we, we use it as kind of a 10-4 good buddy Roger, over and out. We just symbolized that we're, we're done talking, so we're going to stick that word on there that, 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 we need to, that we need to put on there. Roger, kind of like Barney Fife on the radio. Oh, over and under, over, whatever that word is. You know what that word means? So be it. Let it be true. When, when we use that word, we're affirming something. To be true. In, 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 in the language of New Guinea, it's, it simply means true. True. If we were to go to British Parliament 
we would hear somebody say, if they agreed with another guy that got up and spoke and, and made some kind of remark, that they, they would jump up and they would say, uh, true, true. That's, that's what that word means. True, true. So when we're given that word, we're saying, all of this is true. Let it be so. Let, 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 it be, let it be true. It, it, it means that, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a verse of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 1.20. Let, listen to what it says. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. Unto the glory of God by us. Now, what, what, what that means is this, is that all the promises... Some 7,000 of them. All the promises of God are yes, true in God. All the promises of God are, the, sometimes the word amen is translated verily, verily. So sometimes when, when, when we get that, we find out that, that the promises of God are, 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 are true, verily true. Let it be so in Christ. So when we're given this instruction to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let it be so, verily, verily so. Amen. Let it be. I'm going to sing this song, and this song will stand as our benediction from this service tonight. Our Father, we chart in heaven, hallowed be. into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for
Oh God, speak, Moshe.